<laughs> I love you. Um, this is a fun night. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, in in, in uh, our deity dozen, we have a uh, real fun thing, number three. Help others when you can, not for money, but because it's needed. So how do we help people? Well, sometimes we go over and we physically help and carry stuff in. Other time we do it by introducing them to the right people. Other time we do it by help spreading their word. The good things that they're doing out in the world and people can't hear their voice. So you take what they're saying and you repeat it and you said he said it. You know, it's like how we discovered um, hearts and hands, you know. You know, we found them and we, and we agreed on everything and, and we started walking the path together. So helping others when you can and not for money because it's needed always brings out the greatest adventure in life. Wonderful things happen when you do this. So without any further ado, um, this is, <laughs> never had this before, so the introduction has to be correct. Um, we're going to have the last president you'll ever need. Okay, uh, Adam, uh, yeah, come on, yeah, seriously, you can stand up, I'm, I'm giving you an early plug. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Adam Koresh. Did I, did I say that right? Say it right. Adam Kokesh. Kokesh, Adam Kokesh. Never say it right because... Don't say chorus. Co <laughs> <laughs> Take the mic. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Bill. Hello, Church of Cannabis. I love you. What a, what a wonderful evening. What a great group of people to be with tonight. And God, I got to say, Bill, if, I wish I had a pair of rose-colored glasses like that, because if I did, I would have smoked before getting up here, and no one would have been able to tell the difference. Uh, I've been traveling for a long time, touring uh, to promote our book, Freedom, about how we make the world a better place by getting past this paradigm of violence and statism. And I've traveled through almost every different cannabis jurisdiction in the United States and always have to ask, I go, how legal is it here? How legal is it here? And it's pretty amazing how far we've come. Most places in the United States, you really don't have to be paranoid anymore. Like, that's amazing. We have come so far. In fact, I think we've come so far. We've made weed so legal that it's not even fun to smoke anymore. I know that's crazy. Like it's when I, okay, Bill's gonna take issue with that. Well, when I used to travel, like just years ago, like and, and you know this from touring, like people would come up like, hey man, I, I got you some weed. Look at what I scored for you, right? Now you know at, at post parties, it's like, all right, so did anybody bring anything for us? And they're like, oh, well, you didn't pick any up on the store on the way here. Like it's it's that much of no big deal anymore. We are at, I think, the end of the beginning of the end of the war on drugs, as, as Winston Churchill might have described it. Is this not a beautiful time to be alive in America? Yeah, let's celebrate how far we've come. Now, I'm here because I'm running for the Libertarian Party nomination for president, and I, I really like the way Bill phrased it, the last president of the United States you'll ever need. I would say you'll never need. Do we really need someone in some far off capital telling us how to live our lives here in our communities? No. I don't think so. So my platform is really fundamentally different. It's based on localization. You know, I, I, anytime someone introduces me as a presidential candidate, I always have to be like, oh, whoa, 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 don't get the wrong idea. I'm not some psychopath. <laughs> like really, it's who wants to wield this power over other human beings that shouldn't exist in the first place. My platform is based on ethics. If you give me a power over other people that shouldn't exist, you say, here, put on the ring. What do you do? Throw the ring in the fire, right? So we're going to take the federal government through a peaceful, orderly, responsible bankruptcy process that leaves us with 50 independent states and up to 562 sovereign native nations. Now, there are two really important issues that, it, that this addresses, although I found with localization, every stone I turn over and go, oh, what about that, what about that, what? It, it makes everything better across the board. 
centralized control, we take it for granted, but it has so many disastrous effects that localizing power ultimately down to the community as in a voluntary unit, like it solves so many problems. And uh, I was speaking at a, a California independence movement event a few weeks ago, Cal Exit. Uh, everybody's heard, right? There's a movement in California to split off and be their own country. You guys, you, I, I don't know if this is the right crowd to ask, but you wouldn't miss them here, would you? <laughs> right? Now, you would think as, if you were a, a, a libertarian or a conservative in the state of California that you might be worried, right? If California goes independent, it's going to go more liberal. But even if what you want is a smaller government in that sense, if California goes independent and goes slightly more liberal, the viciousness of that state government, its effectiveness and its ability to rip off the citizens is decreased down to a small fraction of what it is today when it's disconnected from the fiat currency system, the federal government's corrupt corporatist policies, all the regulation and legal nonsense that we get from Washington, D.C. So even there, everybody gets what they want. But more importantly, if California asserts their right to say we're going to be independent, do you think that state government is ever going to be able to stop, say, Orange County from breaking off and saying, well, we want to be independent too? And what this is a fundamental assertion of is that you own yourself, top to bottom. And I love where we are with cannabis on this issue in the United States today. People say cannabis is a gateway drug. You guys think cannabis is a gateway drug? No. Well, you're wrong. It is a gateway drug because you cannot smoke pot and not realize that government is totally full of shit. <laughs> it's a gateway to freedom, to awareness, to acknowledgement of the fact that you own yourself as a free, beautiful, independent human being. That's such a beautiful thing to see that, that humanity is going through realizing as we overcome the drug war. So there are two major specific issues that, that I want to bring into this campaign that I think are national embarrassments that have lingered for far too long. And one of them for me as a veteran is military veteran suicides. 22 a day, right? right. Hugely underreported statistic, if anything. And having been through this myself, you know, I, 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 when I got out of the Marine Corps, I went to the VA in Washington, D.C., supposedly the, the flagship of veterans care in America. And I went and I talked to a shrink for five minutes. I don't, just don't, I'm, I'm having trouble sleeping. Can I get something to help with this? I walked out of there that day with a little brown paper bag, five prescriptions. Three of them had suicide listed as a side effect. They are literally killing veterans on behalf of the pharmaceutical industry. And it was only because I had access to cannabis that I was able to avoid this. I took, the only one of the prescriptions I took was Xanax as needed for anxiety. And I was like, wow, this is like smoking pot but with a headache. Screw this. But if I hadn't had access, I could have been just another statistic. Now, politically, libertarians, we like to use the word privatize. And the summer this has a bad connotation politically because traditionally privatize has meant take things out of the public's hands and give them to private interests, corporations, the rich assholes who pull the strings on the system, right? But in this case, the solution with localization, privatization is totally different. I want to see the VA privatized. Give every single veteran in America one ownership voting share of the VA and the drug war. Give us the right to medicate with the freedom that we allegedly fought for. And I guarantee you won't have 22 veterans committing suicide a day in this country. <laughs> the other one is Native American rights. And I say this in every opportunity I get to talk about this platform. But like, this doesn't get talked about. Like, we've just kind of accepted, oh yeah, remember how we screwed over and murdered and poisoned all those people and then, you know, pushed them onto reservations? Yeah, we just kind of, we were hoping we could just forget about that. No, 
No, and every time it comes up, you go, wow, how have we not done something about this yet? So it's really simple. If you're running for president of the United States, and you are not in your platform specifically offering every native tribe in this country sovereignty, what you're saying is that we should keep them on the reservations. We should keep them victimized. We should keep the violations of the treaties in place. That is absolute nonsense. And I think if you're running for president, and you don't have a serious proposition on how to deal with native rights and veteran suicide, you should not be taken seriously as a presidential candidate. Yeah. So, this idea of localization is so universal in its appeal because it's about customizing government, right? Why should we be fighting issue by issue? And it's kind of sad today if, if, with the polarization in this country. If you're a liberal and you meet a conservative on the street, you kind of have to meet each other as enemies. Because you're going to argue over issues. One of you is going to win in the national political sense and have your will forced on the people who lost that debate. But the only people who win in this situation are the people who control this process. All the corrupt special interests in Washington. And so the difference with this campaign is really a fundamental paradigm shift to say, let's stop arguing issues and instead take issue with these corrupt assholes trying to force their will on us from thousands of miles away. <laughs> so I actually have a little bit of an exclusive story that I've been waiting to tell just for this occasion because it's been kind of an interesting legal situation for me. This has been pending for two years now. And Bill, you might remember, and, and I know the people who are here on my team who have been with me for a long time, and I hope everybody gets to meet uh, Michael Wood and, and uh, Marcus Poulos, our press secretary, and, and David uh, Dunlop, our driver in the back there, and my government wife. We're not officially married yet. We're wearing rings. Uh, we're government married. We haven't had our own ceremony yet. My wife, Samantha Miller, is here. Yeah, for, for putting up with me on the road. I mean, come on, that's got to be worth a round of applause, right? Uh, when we announced this campaign two years ago in January, and we were running and started abnormally early because we're not running to say, hey, I'm the best guy for the job. You should vote for me because I look good in a suit and tie, and I sound authoritative, and I should be in charge of stuff. No, it's nonsense. I mean, this idea even that, oh, I'm qualified to be president of the United States. Really? Like, I, you want a human being with their finger on the red button? This, you know, nobody, nobody in the world is qualified to be in charge of a fundamentally criminal organization that is the federal government of the United States. So when we announced January of 2018, it was January 16th, I was driving through Wise County, Texas. S don't jump ahead, Bill. I know you know where this story is going, right? So I was driving the bus, y'all see outside, No Force One, our campaign bus, and I was pulled over by Texas State Troopers uh, first, for swerving. Okay. And I, as I always do, when the officer came to my window, I'm very friendly. And I'm, I'm engaging with them. You know, really, what's going on, officer? How you doing? You know, and I, I know, generally, if you're not really good at it, don't talk to cops. You will only get yourself in trouble, right? Has everybody seen, you know, like enough videos about this? Has this gotten out online? I, show of hands. Does everybody know how to, how, to, how to not deal with cops, basically, right? Don't talk to cops unless you absolutely have to or you're getting really good video out of it. And in this case, officer comes up to the, 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 uh, the, the passenger window of the RV and I lean out and he, he hands me a warning citation for swerving and I hand him a copy of my book. He goes back to his car, right? And I, I don't, you know, I get back on the road, no big deal. 45 minutes later, I get pulled over again. And you go, this time for speeding, I think for going like three over. Right. 
And so I have my dog in the RV. They pull me over. They have me on the side of the road. I'm live streaming this on Facebook. They say, well, we want to search your vehicle. Well, of course, I decline the search. Duh. And they say, well, tough. We're going we're to bring a drug dog. And so they, they actually had a drug dog go around the vehicle while my dog was in the RV. But that's, that's how we knew there were drugs in the vehicle. You guys all know this is nonsense, right? That what, what, are, what, are, what are police drug sniffing dogs? Probable cause, 85% wrong, yeah. They're, probable cause generating units, right? That's what their job is, is to generate probable cause, not, not to actually find anything or, or catch bad guys or anything that, that, that we would hope government would be doing with the resources that we give them to provide for the public safety as opposed to go after people for victimless crimes. Anyway, I was booked into the, uh, the Wise County Jail after some contraband, we'll just say, was found in my vehicle. And... I ended up, uh, I did 10 days in, in the Weiss County Jail because I refused to pay bail or post bond and, and basically negotiated it down to zero. They wanted $80,000 bond or something ridiculous like that. But just by staying there for 10 days, being a pain in the butt. By the way, um, is anybody here sick today? Anybody got coronavirus? No? If you have coronavirus, please cover your mouth when you cough. Or, or go outside. You guys don't have to worry about getting sick from me. I've been drinking plenty of Corona lately. But if you go, if you go to jail, there's, there's a little trick. If, if, you, if you don't want to go to general population, I was just thinking about this because apparently the two million people in jails in the United States, what's the number? How many people in jail in the United States right now? Too many? Way too many? An exceedingly criminal, absurd too many? Well, what's the actual number now? Does anybody know? 25% of the world's prison population, but out of, out of 330 million Americans, 2.12 million, that it, it sounds about right. I just don't know what the latest number is. It, they're at, at, at the mercy of the jail system if one person gets let in with a communicable disease, you know, they, they, don't have, they can't you know, socially distance themselves or get, <laughs> use their commissary money to get masks and hand sanitizer, right? So. When I, when I go to jail, and I, and I hope everybody here keeps this little trick in their back pocket, if you don't want to go to general population, all you have to do is refuse to take the tuberculosis test. Then they can't, because you might have tuberculosis, we can't let you into the general population. Yeah, so you know, they, they try to, you, you, when they go and they try to put a little needle in your arm, you just say, oh, it's against my religion to let government agents put needles in my body, and they can't do anything about that. It's great. So I did 10 days, I got out, and they told me I was facing a misdemeanor for cannabis possession, a felony for tampering, and felonies for coke, mushrooms, and DMT. So four, yeah, it's, a, it's a fun bus. Uh, so four felonies and a misdemeanor. We have a lot of fun on the road, don't we? Um, but now we are traveling with no contraband whatsoever. We learned our lesson, and we're gonna be good from now on. I wish I could say that with a straight face. Damn. All right. So I was, I was facing, uh, it, took, well, it took them a year to arraign me on the misdemeanor charge. I had to drive from Arizona back out to Texas. Showed up. I was like, wait, wait, you don't even have the, the felony charges filed on me yet? This is ridiculous. So I went in and they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I filed a motion for discovery and for, you have to, you have to file a motion for a court recorder in Texas. If you don't ask for one, there's just no record of your hearing sometimes. Like, really? How many, has, how many of you have been to court in this room? Is do, do, in Indiana, do they let you... That's almost everybody. Um, in Indiana... <laughs> yeah, no surprise here, right? In Indiana, do they let you bring in uh, video cameras or, or record... No? No. At least not in Morris County. Yeah. Yeah, well, th that's the norm in the United States. We have a fundamentally secret court system that doesn't operate with transparency. You go, huh, geez, really? Like, yeah, that's how they get away with everything they get away with. So it took them a year and a half then to arraign me on the felony charges. And I went before the judge in front of a packed courthouse and they had all these guys lined up in black and white striped suits and people in regular clothes behind me and lawyers on the other side. And I showed up in cargo shorts and flip-flops and my little plaid short sleeve button-down because I'm not going to dress up for this crap. And 
I'd rather dress up for church than dress up for court when it's the Church of Cannabis at least, right? So this, yes! So the judge is, you know, at an arraignment, I'm, I'm going to, to defend myself. And his job is to determine whether or not I'm competent enough to defend myself. <laughs> and at one point in the proceeding, I had to be like, yes, judge, I don't call him your honor. Sir, if I'm feeling nice, judge otherwise, no judge, I can read and write English and I know how to use the internet. I mean, it, was, it was really embarrassing what he was doing. So I, I, you know, I punked him and turned around right back and he said, why are you doing this? I said, because the drug war is bullshit and lawyers have a stranglehold on this country. That's why I'm defending myself. And he said, are there any other reasons? Said, well, uh, for fun. <laughs> And he goes, oh, this is fun for you? I'm saying, like, well, yeah, it's fun for me. This is kind of like my job, standing up to government. Isn't it fun for you being government? You get to sit two feet higher than everybody else in this courtroom and look around. Everybody here has to do exactly what you say. They, they have to pay it. They can't even pull their cell phones out. They have to pay attention to you. Really, you don't have fun with this. So I had some nice moments of embarrassing him. And so they knew they were on notice you know, what I could do in court, at least. And I'm a member of the Native American church, the Oklahoma Native American church. And so I, actually, I carry a card that, that has that federal authorization. It has my photograph. It cites the federal law. It says the bearer of this card is entitled to yada, yada, yada. And he, he, he read my rap sheet. And at the end of reading, for those of you that don't know, I have a bit of a history of civil disobedience. <laughs> it's quite a rap sheet. <laughs> When you look at it in black and white in legal terms, it looks really good. <laughs> By his standards, maybe really bad, but he went through reading at the end of it. I was like, all right, so this is to the DA. All right, sir, so uh, what was the last time you had someone in here defending themselves bragging about their rap sheet? And he says, uh, yeah, it's never happened. Yeah, I'm not sure what to do. So I took out my Native American church card. I put it on his desk. I said, have you ever seen one of these? And he's like, no, you might want to go make a photocopy of that and come back in a couple of weeks, tell me what you really want to do with this. Now, there have been enough cases in the United States where people have been denied re religious right to, yeah, I'm, <laughs> there are plenty of cases in the United States where people have, have tried to play the religious exemption card under the RFRA, Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1995, which is the federal law that allows for people to claim this religious exemption because Congress knew at some point that they couldn't maintain their credibility that America is the land of the free and tell natives, yeah, but you can't practice your religion with peyote. So they had to carve out a very specific legal space for that, right? And there have been a bunch of people who have tried, well, I'm Church of Ganja, so I'm free to... No, because this, 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 and this. And they, they've put out all of these criteria by denying... Like, I'm just very fortunate in my timing in this case because they have established the legal precedent by which they deny people this right. So I wrote up a letter, and I'm, I'm really excited to be posting this. I'll, I'll post it online tonight. I'm really excited to be sharing it with you tonight, Bill. And this is the first time telling the story. Really grateful to be getting it out on the internet for everybody who's watching online and hopefully sharing this video, because this is hopefully a legal story that ends up being helpful. So I wrote this letter that had all these criteria for the religious defense. And I went back and forth. They said, well, it's not good because it's missing this. And I said, okay, well, then I'll put that in there. Well, it's not good because it's missing. Okay, well, I'll put that in there. How long do you want to go back and forth on this? It's been two years now. And it was two years. They're like, all right, we'll offer you pretrial diversion. And I said, shove it. I want to win on the religious defense. And so they kept going back and forth. And finally, they said, all right. And this is, this is now a drag on. This was last week in Texas that I fought, yeah, from January 2018. And I haven't talked about this at all publicly because of the legal liability pending. It's finally wrapped up. So like I said, I'm really excited to be premiering this story at the Church of Cannabis for the first time ever because it's, it's got a really happy ending. If you couldn't tell where this was going, I'm not in jail right now, right? <laughs> so 
What they finally came down, I told them like, well, hey, if I'm going to take a pretrial diversion, it better be the best deal possible. And I want on the record that you responded to the religious defense, that this was the pressure that led you to do this, that you were doing this at least out of a pretend respect for my rights because they asserted my rights. I'd like to encourage people to assert their rights. And, and so what I ended up doing is filing a motion to dismiss with this letter, which is to whom it may concern. My name is Adam Kokesh. I assert my religious right to be exempt from all Controlled Substance Act laws. And they came back and then they offered me the very best pretrial diversion offer that they possibly could, which basically comes out to $480. So I took four felonies and a misdemeanor and by applying the religious defense, got it reduced to a $480 citation. What else can I say to make sound effects happen? <laughs> All right. So, like I said, this, this message of localization is really bringing people together. And I would like to say that in a sense, everybody's a libertarian, they just don't know it yet. If a libertarian is someone who believes in freedom, every human being with an independent will that wants to be respected in the world is some kind of a libertarian. And I think for a long time, we as libertarians have been caught up playing their game. Like I said, arguing issue by issue instead of taking issue with the, the premise of the system. And so I go to the extremes. I'm, I'm of, uh, of Jewish descent, if you couldn't tell. Yeah, well, my, my grandparents left, uh, uh, left Europe to avoid the Holocaust. And so freedom of movement, you know, talking about immigration is obviously very important to me as well. Uh, but I, I see the rise of fringe white nationalism in, nationalism in the United States as, I mean, it's fringe. You know, Jews will not replace us, tiki torches, y'all saw that, right? It's viscerally disturbing to me from that family history. But I can still say as a libertarian whose worldview is based on love and respect for my fellow human beings, I can still say to those people, look, if you want an ethnostate, like, that's disgusting. If you want to form a community based on racial division, if you want to live with people just like that and exclude people who don't meet your standards, okay, I'm never going to live there, but if you can form that community voluntarily and not hurt anybody and not force it on anybody, I still want you to have that right. This is the modern equivalent of, I might disagree with what you say, but I will fight to the death for your right to say it. I can go to the flip side of this and say, all right, you're a gun-grabbing socialist who wants to live in a nudist commune in the woods. Great, I'm probably not gonna live there either. I'll take my entertainment value from a distance. But similarly, I want you to have that right. And when we get to that kind of love and acceptance, we can really bring people together around freedom and that which unites all of us. So this idea of localization, again, as a matter of national policy. Basically, I'm the none of the above candidate. If you don't want to be ruled, if you don't want to be governed, if you look at the other presidential candidates and say, turd sandwich, giant douche, no thanks, I'm your guy, we don't need a president. And in 2016, if not voting was counted as a vote for nobody, the electoral college results would have been Trump 21, Hillary 72, and nobody in an epic landslide of historic proportions, 445. The American people are ready for fundamental change. So thank you for your time and your attention. And if you want to help make this happen, thank you for being a part of this effort. Thank you for being a part of the Church of Cannabis and spreading all the love that you do here with Bill around your community. This is an awesome group and an awesome opportunity for me. Thank you very much. Sorry, just a couple, couple little uh, admin things. I got copies of my book and palm cards right out front. Happy to sign them for anybody who wants to afterwards. Thank you very much, Bill. I love you. There you go.
Yeah, I see. Uh, hi, I love you. Um, that, Adam, you're awesome. That, that was outstanding. I'm just My cheeks hurt. Um, I got mescaline cheeks. Um, I love you.